Everybody hear me loud and clear, great. So, a um, bit about myself to start off with. Um, Rick Dobney, I'm a um, full-time IT professional. So, my day job is staring at screens, which is ironically what I'm doing tonight as well. Um, but, uh, no, I, I work full-time uh, IT manager for a, a company that supplies systems and solutions for the gas and water utility sector. So. Um, we've been one of these industries in the UK that have been active throughout this, this recent lockdown, uh, so work certainly hasn't dried up for me. A um, bit about, uh, you yeah, know, so IT is my day job. Um, would turn, to be honest with you, that's my therapy. You know, I, I, I first got into turning, uh, I looked at the records, probably about 2008 was when I felt, bought my first lathe. Um, my first lathe was um, uh, an impulse buy off eBay. To be honest with you, I can't even remember what brought me to, to buy it, apart from the fact you can't have too many tools. And I saw it and I thought, 60 quid, that's all it was, so I bought it. It was a little Clark Woodworker lathe. Um, I couldn't use its uh, face plate. I could only use it between centers because if I took the tailstock away, the spindle drifted out of the headstock. It was that kind of quality tool that I invested in. Um, but it was sufficient for me to get the bug, it really was. And I think within a matter of two or three months, uh, I'd started splashing the cash and bought my first, uh, what you might call a real lathe. Um, it was one of the, uh, the Chinese mass produced ones uh, with a, a lever variable speed on it. But again, it had the capacity and capability to really allow me to start um, developing, uh, developing the skills and ideas. Um, Initially, I was self-taught. I probably spent uh, 12, 18 months um, making mistakes, uh, learning how to sharpen as best as I could. Um, I didn't actually realise until I had my first lesson with a chap called Bob Chapman, who uh, I'm sure many of you, particularly in the UK, will know, Bob Chapman up in Bingley. Uh, I had a first lesson with Bob. Um, I remember the lesson very nicely. I took some of my prize pieces up there. The first thing he did was turn them over and criticise the chucking point that I got on there. So uh, that was certainly a salient lesson that I, I learned from that course. Um, the other thing I learned was I'd actually been presenting the tools completely incorrectly. I've been doing sort of scraping cuts with, uh, with gouges, which I wasn't a big one for watching, you know, like I said, YouTube. So it was only me using the tools I thought best, but it was quite a revelation to, to learn how to use the tools correctly. So uh, I thank Bob for that, and it's helped me to, uh, you know, to develop and hone my skills from that point onwards. Um, so that was my first lesson, and I said the important lessons learned. You know, subsequently training, uh, I've had uh, two or three days with our good friend Andrew Hall. I'll come on to a bit more of uh, my experiences with Andrew later on. And I've also managed to take advantage of some of the courses that the AWGB have uh, presented. So uh, I did the, uh, the demonstrator training course uh, with a good friend of mine, Gordon. Um, and then we did, I did the, the, the tuition course as well. So how to actually present it, so how to actually teach best practices and how to teach. So I probably wear my AWGB approved tutor badge when I'm, uh, when I'm teaching and presenting. Um, so, yeah, teaching in it's, it's, it's lessons, it's not something I've done a great deal of, but um, one of the greatest things you can do is just attend demonstrations, your know, club demonstrations, and you know, watch closely the, the skills and techniques of, of experienced turners. Um, there's so many different ways of using tools um, different, to different effect. The majority of them are safe and effective. You see a few bad practices which uh, you shy away from, but it's picking these skills up and these ideas and then taking them back to your own workshop, which in my view, that's, that's all part of your learning process. Not necessarily formal lessons, but listening to people and you know, watching and learning and, and basically growing and growing your ideas and experiences from, uh, from as Jeff said, this, this great community of sharers that we, we work amongst. So um, yeah, that's, uh, that's basically my, my teaching, uh, sorry, my learning experience to date. Um, what, who inspires me now was one of the questions. Um, I wouldn't say I've got any one particular um, turner that I would say inspires me as such. I think there's so much inspiration that we see, whether it's on 
uh, individual Turner's websites or um, just trawling through um, the um, images that we can see on the internet, do any search for uh, classic forms or ceramics or natural forms, forms in nature. There's so much inspiration out there which we can, we can take on board and just create your own little gallery of ideas and inspiration. So when you're coming for some ideas to incorporate into your work, you've got a library there ahead of you that you can, you can just draw on. So yeah, uh, inspiration. Um, that's, that's really where I source my inspiration from. I will just take this opportunity now. I mentioned, uh, mentioned my good friend Andrew earlier on. Uh, Andrew has been a great mentor to me and a support. He's, he's helped me no end to get the confidence to get out there and demonstrate uh, to, to the public, to, you know, to complete strangers. Um, he's, you know, he's, he's supported, helped and advised me in, in getting to where I am today. And I'd just like to publicly thank him for that because yeah, without him, I wouldn't be where I am now. So thank you, Andrew. Um, what do I like to turn? I'm gonna take you through some of the pieces um, shortly, uh, but I do like to work on large feature pieces. So um, I'm one of these sort of wood magpies. We've got uh, Sheffield Wood Turning Club, which is where I, uh, I get when we when the club's actually operating. We have a, a great guy called Steve Wright from the El Elston Sawmill, and he brings some absolutely fantastic pieces of wood. Uh, and I tend to buy them without even knowing what I'm going to do with them, and they sit on the shelf, and eventually I get some inspiration and convert them into, into something hopefully worthwhile and complementary to the wood. Um, so I do like turning you know, pieces of striking wood, purely decorative, ornamental pieces. Um, the other side that I like to do is uh, multi-axis um, offset turning work, which we're going to focus on shortly. Um, what are the techniques do I like to combine with my turning? Again, I'll show you. In fact, I'll show you now. This is, um, you'll see it, I'll show you on the, on the big picture, but this is a piece that I make where uh, I'm actually incorporating turned aluminium. So I'm um, turning aluminium on the wood lathe uh, and then making a three part goblet, um, all, all using wood turning tools on the wood lathe. I think you can get some very nice striking effects, great finish, very durable finish using aluminium. Uh, I've also used it on this box, so a beaded coloured box with an aluminium finial. So it's uh, yeah, quite a nice asset to your turning, so you can add handles, finials, stems, as you see. And it's quite workable, so that makes quite a nice, uh, quite a nice addition to your project. Okay, um, do I convert my own timber or buy blanks and boards? I do a bit of all sorts. As I mentioned earlier on, uh, Steve Wright, who visits Sheffield Club, brings all sorts of both pre-cut blanks and uh, board materials. So there's some, you know, some lovely timbers that he, he finds. It makes out that it's too good for turners, but uh, no, he does bring some lovely wood. So uh, being the magpie I am, I tend to uh, stash things away. I've got a garage full of wood. Uh, I'm actually just in the middle of uh, installing a new wood store down the bottom of the garden. So that will be a wood store and uh, wood preparation area. Uh, I've got two pallets of wood further down the garden that are tarpaulined over because the old wood store was knocked down uh, for the, uh, my, my wife's greenhouse. Um, so we're in a bit of a state of moving things around. So I can't really tell you for a tour around the wood, but uh, take it as read, there's lots of it in various states from uh, nicely machine blanks right down to rough logs that have just been sealed, awaiting preparation. Um, one point I would make on that, uh, I'm looking to actually do a chainsaw course. I don't currently have a chainsaw. And my wife uh, quite rightly says, you're not having a chainsaw till you know how to use it. So um, I have promised I will go on a training course, learn how to handle the tool correctly, get the correct PPE, and then I've got a great pile of wood to get stuck into to get it all prepared up. Uh, but I do see people using chainsaws with, uh, you know, a pair of shorts and flip flops and things like that. And it's, uh, it makes your blood curdle when you see it. So health and safety is always paramount in that, uh, in that respect. So I will follow my wife's uh, sage advice there. Um, 
Which is your favourite lathe and why? I'll just turn my laptop slightly. There's my lathe. I'll show you around the proper look around the workshop, but I was very fortunate. I was able some time ago to, to buy the 2436 one way. It's an absolutely fantastic piece of equipment. Um, power throw over the, over the bed. I can turn off the end of the bed for the larger pieces. Um, it's beautifully smooth. Uh, it does everything I could possibly want to be. If I was to say there's any one limitation with it, it would be the actual between centers. So if I'm doing any large spindle work, it says it's 36 inches between centers, but that's the absolute maximum you can possibly get. Um, in those situations, you have to use a bit of uh, intelligence and design. I did some six foot spindles for um, uh, a child's cot a few, uh, a few months ago and end up turning them with uh, tenons, mortises, and joined three sections together and made a glued up spindle. Uh, six foot tall, but if you use a little bit of um, process, thought process, um, you can you can always adapt and get yourself around these limitations. Uh, this workshop I'm in, while we're talking about it, it's not particularly big. I had to do a full overhaul of it when I when we moved here. We've been here two and a half years. Uh, it's uh, five meters by three meters, um, so it was. A Complete overhaul, so new electrics, new concrete floor, re-plasterboard and insulated. Um, I invested in the LED panel lighting, so I've got a completely shadow-free environment to work in, which is, is brilliant. You might get a little bit of a washout with the colour because the lighting is so is so bright in here, but um, hopefully we can uh, we can do justice to the to the demonstration. Um, do I teach and do demos? Uh, yes and yes. Uh, I first got into demonstrating five years ago, so we gradually built up um, to the point where last year uh, I had more than my day job was actually permitted. It was actually becoming quite a struggle, so I've had to ration uh, the number of bookings that I can take. So I'm typically doing about 18 to 20 demonstrations, club demonstrations a year. Uh, which doesn't sound an awful lot, but when you're working five days a week and you're traveling two hours at the end of a working day to do a demonstration, it can be quite, um, you know, it can be quite a long night. You're getting home at about midnight by, before you know it. So uh, I do have to ration the number of demos. Um, teaching wise, it's something I thoroughly enjoy. Um, I've got a growing number of students, or shall we say had a growing number of students. All, all the classes that I do are either in the workshop here or I will demonstrate, uh, in, oh, sorry, I will teach in uh, individuals' own workshops. Um, mixed benefits, obviously, in my own workshop, I've got all the tools, all the PPE that we need to be able to do the uh, training effectively. However, uh, the majority of people will not have a one-way lathe that they can go back and learn on. So often better to teach them how to use their lathe, their tools, their sharpening systems, in their own working environment. So I do tend to you know, do a few uh, local trips or did until the lockdown here. Um, I've talked about my full-time occupation. Um, where and how do I sell my work? Uh, most, I don't actually get enough time in the workshop. Uh, it sounds like I'm, I'm whinging and moaning, I'm not. I really wish I had more time in the workshop to actually make things. Uh, I do do quite a few commissions, so uh, it's something I do enjoy because you get quite a few ad hoc requests coming through and they tax you. Uh, believe you me, I've had some very strange requests come through, um, some which I'm not going to air in public, but um, uh, yeah, very interesting. Everything from chess pieces, replica chess pieces. I had a stand for an African tribal mask was one that I was asked to do. Uh, I've done little spindles, matching spindles for... Uh, a vintage writing box. Uh, I had a, a guy who built his own timber framed house, wanted some light fittings making. So it's such a variety, so mixtures of individual one off pieces and um, uh, copy turning as well. So, copy turning, I don't do, I'm not a production turner, far from it, I don't have the time for that, but it can be quite a challenge to do um, you know, short runs, um, you know, 10, 15 of a, of a certain item for. Um, for jobs that typically a production turner, are too, it's too small for them to take on as a copy process. Um, final question on the list before I give you a quick tour through the pieces is where would you like your turning to go in the future? 
absolutely would like to reduce the IT day job. Um, I currently work five days. If we get that down to three days a week and fill two days a week with, with tuition, uh, I would love that. Uh, I get such a buzz out of teaching people. And there is a demand out there. It comes to me without me even advertising. So I know the demand is there. The business is there. It's just balancing the, uh, the, the, the accounts at home to, uh, to make that come to fruition. But that's certainly something I'm aspiring to. Um, I've got a few ideas which I want to share with you very shortly. Uh, other areas that I want to just hone, um, you, know, you, know, you know the principles behind turning, but honing your skills, it's all about time on the lathe. And as I said, I really just don't get enough time to really polish some of the techniques that I would like to develop. Um, I'll, is there any particular questions part that's popped up now that I answered before I give you a quick tour of the, the, the pieces that I've on display? Yes, please, Rick. Just a quick note. There's people trying to get in and uh, I'm trying to let you in there, but I can't when you're coming in is your name as iPad. This is one of the reasons we would like people to change their names on their picture that's here. Like I'm seeing people called iPad. If that's coming into the waiting room with issues like this, we're not going to let it in. Okay. And I think that's understandable. Um, there's people messaging me, their names aren't coming up in the waiting room. I'm seeing iPads and computers and things, and we're not letting them in. I have messages, if you can hear me through Facebook or whatever, I don't know what way it's working. Please put your name on it, we'll let you in. Sorry, Rick. Um, Rick, aluminium, turning aluminium, what tools do you use, please? High-speed steel tools, just standard high-speed steel tools. Uh, the only thing I use in addition is I use molly slip cutting compound, and it just preserves the cutting edge on the tool. I can turn, for example, the stem on that goblet from a piece of uh, 18 millimeter bar stock. I can turn that down to a finish with one, one sharpening of the tool. So as long as you preserve the, the, the cutting edge, use a machine lubricant on the tool, you can use a standard high-speed steel tool, a standard grind, uh, and it will do the job. A little bit of work about getting the presentation um, correct. Um, but that's, that's just part of the technique. I can't really go into that today, but that's, that's part of the process. Okay, Rick, what glue do you use to glue the timber to the aluminium, please? Uh, I just use a medium CA glue. Okay. I um, made a mistake once of using Gorilla Glue and it blew out the sides and made the right mess of it. So yeah, just a medium CA glue. Okay, speed of rotation when cutting aluminium. Uh, depends on the, the diameter of the stock, but typically um, I don't tend to use the gauges. I, I cut it to a point that's comfortable, so probably about 800. Okay. Um, right, there's a question about your lighting. We leave tech to the last, please. Any horror stories in relation to your students that you were kind of talking about different things or bringing their own tools and things? Any horror stories you'd care to share? No, not really. No, I think you obviously with any student, you're getting such a different uh, range of ability in terms of ability to learn. Uh, I think that the main thing is uh, it's just being so attentive, particularly with the absolute beginners. Uh, I would never do more than, a, uh, more than one student at a time because you have to be so attentive because any slight adjustment on the tool can result in a nasty catch. Uh, but no horror stories. I think the worst one is when you get a student that won't listen. That's the worst horror story because you, you, you're banging your head against a wall and you've just, just got so much danger all the time. So to me, that's the horror story of teaching people who will not listen to you. Okay, Rick, that's all the questions for the moment. If you'd like to move on to the next stage when you're ready, please. Thank you very much. All right, we'll have a quick look now. I'm just going to swap cameras. Uh, I've got a tripod camera, so I'm going to show you some of the pieces and which will lead into the video. So about five minutes on the pieces and then to the video. Okay. Can you hear me still okay? Pat, can you hear me? Oh, sorry, sorry, Rick, I was muted. Try again. Just turn the, just turn the microphone. You're gone away, Rick. Can you hear me? Now I can hear you. Just a bit closer to the mic if you can. Yeah, I just have to move back. I just have to switch microphone as well as camera. So, okay. can you hear me okay? Yeah, that's good now, Rick. Thank you. Okay. So, I'll take you around the pieces. So, these are some of the larger featured pieces that I, I enjoy making. A uh, nice piece of uh, spalted ash. Uh, it's approximately 18 inches diameter. 
So uh, yeah, lovely piece. I've got another piece similar to that one, but uh, not enough display um, space to show that off. Um, this particular piece down here, I'll hold it up to the camera a bit better. Um, this is a piece of cherry. Um, so I, uh, it, it was intended initially to be a complete form, but the cherry was so cracked, uh, I finished up carving through the cracks and actually making a feature of them. I then did a, a texture just using a burr, which partly burnt and partly textured the surface. It was all hollowed through the, through the centre, um, just a natural finish on the inside. But that's uh, that's a favourite piece of mine. Um, but yeah, just a, I know it's cherry. It was from my mother's garden in uh, in Barnsley in Yorkshire. So yeah, a little piece I'm quite fond of. The large piece I've got at the back. Um, I proudly showed this one off at the AWGB. Uh, I titled this one. Uh, if I, I'll just put the camera back a bit. So this piece. I titled it, If I Had Wings, it's a lovely piece of elm burr, probably about uh, 30 inches by 18 inches. So a uh, beautiful piece of wood, the detail on it is fantastic. Uh, took the wings down to about 8 millimetres. So that was quite a scary piece to turn, that was turned outbound. Sorry Rick, can you just move back a bit from the camera, It's um, we're missing a lot of the... Uh, yeah, one second. Just maybe turn a hop a bit from the floor up now you're gone off altogether. Sorry. I think you've knocked it off altogether, Rick. Yeah, one second. Sorry about that. No, it's me. I need you're a second to the floor, Rick. Jeff, that floor is spotless. <laughs> oh, he switched my video off. One second. Okay, there you go. There you're back go. again. So there you go. Just hit back and step back half a step. No, the other way, backwards. There you go, center of the screen for me, thank you. Excellent, I can't go much further back, I've got a PC in the way. <laughs> okay. okay. So yeah, that's the, that's the piece, I call it If I Had Wings. So that was turned outbound on the, on the one way. Um, the wings were turned, as I said, down to about, to about eight millimeters. So that was quite a scary piece to turn with the propeller blade whizzing around so good form nice piece and a lovely piece of wood this was one of the pieces that uh, steve wright brought to the brought to the club at sheffield so yes i'm delighted to turn that uh, lovely piece of wood okay you've seen the small pieces of aluminium work so i'll not uh, spend time on those again let's bring the camera back up uh, some of my very first pieces i made a um, little, little salt cellar, that was when I had my lesson with Bob Chapman, so one of my first uh, talk pieces, a little two part hole form that it turned, so just disguised with the beading around the centre, but a nice little form, lovely piece of wood, and my first and only piece of fruit, so I turned an apple, that was actually from the same blank, so it's the same piece of wood, um, but just nice little form to be there. So moving on, and this is really the purpose of the demonstration today, you know, the presentation, multi-axis work. So I've got a, a display of multi-axis work here. Um, start off uh, showing you, um, this is a piece which I'll show you, you'll see this included on the video, um, but some of the multi-axis work that they do, it's really exploring how we can turn a piece on multiple dimensions uh, rather than just the conventional approach that we would have if we were to turn a piece um, just on the faceplate. So typically what we do with faceplate work is we've got our blank, we have a sacrificial piece on the blank, and then we would fix... Sorry, Rick, sorry to interrupt you again. Just move the camera back a small bit. We're losing half of what you're showing there. Yeah. And just up a bit now, we can see your fridge. There you go, that's better. There right? you go, lovely. This would be a fridge, that one, it's important. Um, so yes, this, uh, if we're turning this piece normally uh, to do off-centered work as, a, as a, just a face plate, as a face piece, what we normally do is fix a sacrificial piece on the back, screw a screw chuck, that's a the face plate onto the back of it, uh, and change our center of rotation by repositioning the, the face plate. I'm going to show you the technique on the video how I got around that. But what my technique does is allows me to turn on the face of the pieces, multiple faces, 
I can actually turn the side pieces, uh, a bit left a bit, so turning the jack seats on pieces. This particular um, box has got 19 different centers of rotation on it. So just playing around, and you'll sh I'll show you the process for that very shortly. Another variation of that which I've got is just same process, but using the glare brushing and design to give us some interesting effects. And that's again using using the jig, uh, turning the uh, the camera's working in reverse on them to turn the camera. So just getting into the present shape patterns. Um, so that's quite quite effective. Can you hear me still? Yep, can indeed. Yeah, so I just got something popping up saying my audio wasn't working. So no, just checking we're okay there, Pat. Thank you. So yeah, just getting nice crescent shaped patterns into the workpiece. So you'll see that very shortly. Uh, another piece which I enjoy demonstrating at clubs, a little bit of off centre work. Um, it's certainly uh, just a, just a fairly simple process, but it's a nice, uh, nice bit of straightforward spindle work with no uh, special tools required. Um, so yeah, that, that's the project which I've, I've demonstrated several clubs there. Okay, um, what I'll do, um, I'll just one final piece to show you, and this is a, an idea which I'm just exploring at the moment. So it's turning triptych, so it's three piece form. So again, it's turned in the tool that I'm going to show you shortly, which allows me to turn different patterns on different faces. This was the only. Break it up. I don't know if you're too far from the mic or what. What it is it the mic? Sorry. Yeah, it was breaking up. So um, maybe we need to get the mic closer. It's close to me. I did get a report up. How's that, Paul? Yeah, that sounds better. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep shouting up. So this is a piece uh, turned as one. So I use um, sacrificial pieces between the uh, the individual um, pieces of wood. Uh, it allows me to turn it as one piece. Uh, within the jig that I'm going to show you, uh, but I can also decorate on all, all faces of the piece. This was just one that I did um, actually did at the New York show a couple of years ago, uh, just a bit of a, a bit of a trial piece, but um, just exploring different ideas. Okay, so I'm going to take this over now. Is there any questions before we do the video? The video is about 15 minutes and then we should get about 15 minutes for any particular questions. Is there anything that wants ask, asking before? Um, any, any questions before yeah. I go into the video? Rick, the, the large piece, could you give an indication of the speed that was turned at? Uh, again, no, because I don't use, it was probably up to a thousand or more. Um, the reason I don't tend to, um, I just don't use speed dials. It's whatever's comfortable, whatever's working correctly for the tool. Because there was so much airspace uh, with that particular project, the faster I could turn it, the less the risk of the tool falling into the air gaps. So speed, it might be daunting to people, but if you keep the tool uh, presentation safe, and you've obviously got a very secure amount on the piece, speed is your friend because it helps to control the, the tool and limit the kind of chat that you get against the, the winds. Okay. Okay, Rick. Um, yeah, there's people wanting to see how you do those pieces, so I think that will be explained shortly. Yeah, Rick, your, Rick, just when the video is on, um, part of the problem with your sound there, the, the picture went very pixelated. I think your signal was dropping, so I don't know if you can check your connections or whatever, please. So. Right, it shouldn't be because I'm on a 60 meg cable connection, but I will check that while the video is going. Yeah. It could be our friends from earlier playing silly boogers, I don't know. Yeah, anyway, cool. over to you. Thank you. Right, so I'll just do a video screen share. Okay, can you hear me still, Pat? You okay, Rick? Can you hear us? 
We, uh, I can can now. Yes, I was just. Uh, did you get cut? Like, I'm not sure whether you see. Yeah, we can hear you clear, Rick, and we have your screen on the screen. Will I have any? Can you can you see the uh, the jig now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. Excellent. Right here we go. Rick, is there supposed to be silent with that? There is indeed, Pat, yes. I'll talk you through what we're doing. So, um, so this is the jig. Uh, I, I turned to start the project, uh, I just turned a square box, so a perfectly square box. Um, the jig is mounted onto the, onto the spindle of the, the lathe, um, and it allows me to use the tail stock to set the absolute center of the rotation. Now, what I'm doing here is uh, just using uh, one of these little uh, grip clamps and what this does is make sure that the two jaws are gripping perfectly both top and bottom of the workpiece so I'm getting a full square uh, 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 contact on the, in the jaws. The ratchet strap uh, tightens this up, uh, makes sure the jaws are perfectly tight and I've then got daisy wheels on the back of the, the jig um, just to secure everything in place. So. There we go. I took the, uh, the loose end of the strap out of the way and that gives me a nice secure hold of the, the workpiece in the jig. So what I'm going to do now is just mark up some um, arcs within the, the piece that I'm going to try and achieve. I'll just wait for me to catch you. I had to cut this video down, everybody, because it was initially about this about an hour and a half, two hours worth of recording. So you can see I've made some marks on the on the on the workpiece of where I'm looking to take the cut. So I've got a half inch saw beam, long, strong spindle gouge here. Um, point I'm making here is you have to be very careful with the presentation, the extension of the tool into the workpiece. Uh, if you allow the tool to drop in, clearly you run the risk of getting a very heavy catch as the, as the workpiece uh, comes round onto the tool. So the initial presentation of the tool is with the flute over at the three o'clock or nine o'clock position. What we're going to do initially here is just turn a couple of uh, V-cuts into the surface. Um, Speed-wise, it's probably turned about 280 RPM. Doesn't sound fast, but it doesn't need to be fast. Uh, when I actually turned the box in the first place to get the square uh, edges on the uh, tenon joint to the lid, uh, I was probably turning about 15 to 1800 RPM. Really turning the speed down for this, giving me the control. So I introduced the tool, um, get the initial bevel support, and then just slightly open the tool out, and that allows me to, to cut the V-shaped profile into the workpiece. Okay, so I'll just do this, uh, take a couple of passes at that, just, it just tidies the, the, the bottom of the, the profile. Sometimes you get a little bit of grain at the bottom which needs um, carefully removing. But all the, all the, uh, the grip, the strength in my hold, it's holding the tool very securely between my thumb, my fingers and the tool rest so I can control to micromillimeters just how much extension of that tool there is into the workpiece. As I said earlier on, the last thing I wanted to do is slip. So you can see there from that first bit of the video, I've got a very clear cut, nice crisp edges, uh, which needs very, very little additional work doing to it. I'm just pointing out here the second arc which I'm going to cut, which is going to pass through the lid and through the, the, the base of the box. It will also, as it comes round, um, you'll see it just clips that corner I was just pointing out with the pencil as well. So we're going to take another cut, but this time you'll appreciate there's probably 70% airspace. I'm struggling here to see the line that I'm going to work to. So a little tip you can do here is apply a piece of masking tape onto your fixed tool rest and then put a line on there which gives you a guide for where to present your tool to. 
I don't put the masking tape right on the metal edge because that's where the tool support is. If I put any cushion in there, it will give me vibration on the tool. I don't want that. So I've just left the, the metal edge raw. But I can assure you that's lined up with where the pencil line is. The tool rest is probably about 20 millimeters away from the workpiece here. And that's purely to give me uh, safety space uh, and space to control the grip. So again, I'm taking the cut into the workpiece, the flute over the three o'clock position here. I've got a bevel support now, opening the cut out, uh, that gives me a supported cut. So I'll just let that progress a little longer and then we reverse the cut. This cut is a little more gentle because of the amount of airspace. If I put too much pressure in here, the tool will drop into those voids and it will get a, a very heavy cut. At the very least, you tend to get um, sort of chatter marks on the entry cut because the tool is actually bouncing into the workpiece. So it's all about an important stronghold uh, of the tool to stop any, any, um, um, any dropping into the, into, the air, into the air spaces. So we're cutting the, the right hand side of the V cut. I'm just going to the beer fridge to grab another bottle of water, bear with me. So we're basically taking two passes, come down one side, uh, move over to the right hand side of the vehicle and then switch back just so we've got a nice crisp, um, crisp profile to the cut. It's a shame you haven't got the noise because you can actually hear the lathe speed. You can hear the tick, 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 tick noise of the lathe revolving. So I'm sorry about that. But again, you can see there we've got a nice crisp uh, cut. Even the bottom corner of the box has been cut cleanly away. You wouldn't get that if you took a heavy cut. So what we're going to do now is just take a little bit of a, a detail cut into the middle. So a different profile. I've swapped to a quarter spindle gouge, a uh, straight spindle gouge here. Um, so we're just going to create a little feature in the middle. I think I have to mess around with the, the tool rest height a bit here in the video if I remember, because it was a bit of a, an entry cut to start off with, and the tool rest was a little bit low. Let's see. I'm sorry why, I don't understand why we're not getting the audio on this because it, it did play okay last time I tried it, but uh, not too much. So I'm just trying to turn the bit of a, a detail form there, so uh, a bit of a, um, uh, I suppose you might call it a, um, a bead shape in the centre with a bit of hollow point in it, uh, just to turn a bit of a decorative profile. All the time, uh, I put the longer tool rest in there for the more observant. You might you might remember I started with the short tool rest at the start of the video. Um, through video editing, actually, it cut out a bit where I changed the tool rest over for the longer one. The longer one allows me to make sure I've got a good support for my the the heel of my hand and my wrist to make sure it, it stays well and truly clear of the whirling dot jaws on the on the jig. What I did there was just to create a small cut with a, a three-point tool just to crisp up the, the intersect between those two features, just makes them more defined. So I'll take a narrow, a fairly uh, shallow curve here. Uh, one technique you can do on here is to use a texturing tool, so as well as turning a, a shallow um, cove form, we could, we could put some pattern in there, we could put some uh, colour in there and maybe use uh, some of the other creams to, to emphasise the, the patterns that we've, we've turned into the workpiece. Rick, your microphone is breaking up there and we're losing sound with you again. I know you have a good mic, so if you... Yeah, I'll just, I'll just reposition it again. Um, yeah, try to stay in the same proximity, it makes it better for us. Thanks. Yeah. How's that? Pat is okay? Yeah, that's perfect there now. Yeah, stay there. Excellent. Please. Okay, yeah. Well, I'm not going anywhere now, so I'll stay put now, Pat. 
So sanding the piece, you might think, what's he doing here sanding? I'm only sanding the bits where I've actually got solid wood. I'm not sanding where there are any air gaps. If I go near the air gaps, I'm going to get uh, knuckle rash. So I'm making sure I'm only coming into contact with uh, solid wood while the wood's working, uh, while the wood's spinning. I'll stop later on and just show you how I sand the other areas. It's very straightforward. When I'm going off the edge, I can't sand that, so I'll simply just use a bit of 240 grit and just tidy up any very minor tool marks or any little bits of grain tear out that there might be. But by holding it in the jig, it makes things so much easier to work on. So, uh, where are we? Um, we're about 10 minutes into the, the video. Um, there's a cut in here shortly. And we're going to change the sense of rotation and just show you the effect that we get of doing some, some intersects. So I'll lock the jaw in place here. Um, and what I've done now is change the sense of rotation. You can see the bit that's spinning now. I'm just turning a couple more intersecting features to tie in with the, the piece that you've seen turn. I haven't shown you this whole process because it's a 15 minute demonstration. Um, you've seen the cutting process. I want you to see the, the finished results of using the jig. So we've got a nice intersect there, cutting between the two features. Um, but you see where the lines are on this particular piece. I keep pointing the screen thinking you can see, but you can see where my finger is there. This new profile on the turn should intersect and give us a nice tight, um, a nice tight uh, join in between the two uh, concentric features that we turn. Well, this, this particular technique, uh, as you saw on the, the box with the 19 centers on it, it's down to your imagination what you want to do with it. Um, you can basically set the rotations, you can move them marginally. Um, it's, it's quite a bit of fun. I pass that box around and ask people to just try and work out how many centers there are on, on the box. And you'd be surprised how many guesses you get because some can be quite marginal. Uh, here I've just swapped over to a portable gouge. Uh, just to turn this, this hollow. This hole is actually going off the edge of the box as well, so it's, it's not an easy cut to turn without getting the catch, particularly at low speed. And again, this is an illustration of I can't sand uh, with the lathe in rotation, I have to sand by hand. The, the box that I showed you earlier on with the 19 centers on it, so much of the time spent on that piece was actually sent, was spent hand sanding, as you see now. Sorry, Rick, can you just move that mic again if you've moved yourself to this? I haven't, no, I'm still pointing at it, Pat. Um, okay, well, it's, you just uh, speak a little bit louder, it seems to help, please. Sorry, it's just breaking up there as well. Okay, so. I think there's a gain just on it as well, but I don't want to mess around with it too much and wreck everything. So this piece I'll show you um, on the camera now. This is a piece I did quite early on. Um, it was turned, it was exactly my mother-in-law's, did, did it for us as, as a present. So you can see all the various centers that I've turned on that face, but what I've also done is turn the sides. So using this jig, it allows me to actually work the, the sides of the piece, as you can see demonstrated there. I'll show you how this actually works. Clearly that piece is too large to hold within the, within the jaws of the chuck. But within the capacity of the lathe, I can actually move it around and achieve those different centers. So imagine that center or the two centers at the corners there, uh, when it's uh, rotating around that point, there's quite a bit of overhang uh, towards the lathe bed and off the edge of the jig. So obviously you need to make sure that you are working within the capacity of the jig. So what I've done, uh, it was actually the piece that I showed you uh, earlier on. I fitted what I refer to as a keel, so the keel, by clamping the keel within the jaws, it gives me far more capacity on the, on the uh, chuck itself to, uh, to turn, the, um, uh, you know, to turn the, the degree of offset. So I'm just adjusting the jaws, loosening them up to the full capacity. And really this is just to illustrate to you the range that you can actually achieve uh, with the jig. 
don't worry, I'll probably talk, showing you this talk bit, but again, just loosening that jaw. You can see pretty much anywhere in the capacity. As long as I can clamp that keel, I can set that center. So anywhere from there, right down here, so I can turn pretty much on the on the opposite corners. So that's the end of the video. Uh, we're going to take some questions. I think we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So uh, hopefully you found that enjoyable. I'll just switch back to cameras. Turn to meeting. Stop sharing. Okay. Okay. Are there any pieces that anybody would like to see while I've got the camera in place and um, the work pieces? There, there's no questions on those. As you can imagine, the jig is the main topic. So when you're ready, yeah. we'll just, I, I think we'll like, condense this. Okay. Because... Well, what I'll do is I'll just bring this down here. Uh, I'll place it down here. I can talk to the mic. I've got two jigs. The larger one, which is the one you saw demonstrated, and um, here is a smaller version that I use on the on my demonstrations that I do around the club. So I'll give you a quick talk through the anatomy of it. Uh, the jig is made out of high density polyethylene. As I mentioned at the start of the presentation, I work for gas and water utilities business and HDPE is one of the materials that we use for quite a few of the fabrications. So um, you can buy the material privately, it's not a problem to buy. There's probably about £60 worth of uh, polyethylene in this particular size jig. So the, the piece itself, I turned the recess in the back. I set a face plate into that recess and then that's bolted through with four securing bolts. The recess stops any lateral movement of the jig. The bolts are purely there to secure the face plate into the recess. And you can see the locked off inside in recess bolt holes and I use the nylock uh, locking nuts and there's a washer behind them to make sure I've got a good secure hold. On the back, you can see I've uh, routed out two grooves, so two parallel grooves. We've got M8 bolts, coach bolts that sit in the jaws. Bolt heads are recessed in, so what that allows me to do is, as I showed you on that previous piece, I can actually see pieces on this jaw face. If I left the bolt heads proud, I would, I would be catching on there and it would change the ori orientation of the workpiece. Um, so the bolts go through the jaws and then they're secured using the, the daisy thumbnails. They're perfectly secure and tight enough to, to hold the workpiece. The other critical component is the ratchet strap. So the ratchet strap is fixed down, you might just see, it's actually screwed down onto the, the jaw. This particular ratchet, stri ratchet strap um, I source these the two for 10 quid from uh, screw fix, a bit of pole placed in there. Um, but they have a 500 kilogram braking strain and a 300 kilogram lashing uh, rating on them. So, perfectly strong and suited to this particular job. The last key area um, the jaw liners. This is an aerated polyethylene. Um, and it's basically it reforms. So if I compress that right back to the, the, the solid plastic, it will still reform to its original shape. It's serving two purposes. One, it's giving me a very secure grip on the workpiece. Uh, and secondly, it's, it's protecting the workpiece. So I can grip firmly without actually damaging and making any marks on the workpiece. Um, and that's pretty much it. So um, it's just something that I've made for myself. I've got, I have taught, I've got three of these now. Uh, this one is the uh, 14 inch version, which will go on my actions to trade uh, demonstration made, which I take out. Uh, the larger one is, is the 20 inch version. Uh, but using the methods that I showed you in the video, it does still allow you to work within the the confines of the uh, clearance of the jig over the overlay there. So um, hopefully that's uh, that's clear. Are there any questions on the jig? Okay, Rick. Um, 
Well, basically, just to remind everybody that at some point you're going to be doing a full Sunday demonstration with this jig, and it'll obviously be explained in far more depth and a better visual on how Rick uses it. Um, I know Rick sent us the video with the sound on it, and unfortunately tonight, gremlins are in the system from all angles. Yeah. Um, so it's just, I think, based on that, Rick, you kind of covered the questions that were coming in. Do you have a website or YouTube videos or anything that you can just tell uh, people about? I don't have uh, I don't have a YouTube site or anything like that. No, I do use I do have a, a website which is uh, Rick Dobney with uh, Rick Dobney Wood Turning. So um, I'll, I'll put a link up on there. There's my site. So if you have a look on. On there, you'll see some uh, some pictures of my work. Um, it looks okay, but it's a little bit out of date. You'll see some of the pieces that I've shown you tonight. Um, there's a few of the multi-axis pieces that have been done on the jig, uh, but I do actually need to update it with some fresh pieces. Uh, to be honest with you, I, my time has been so precious of late, it's, uh, it's been difficult, so. Um, but yes, there's some good illustrations on there. There's also, you'll see the demonstrations, the, the club, demonstrations that I've, I've had over previous years and have booked through for next year and into 2022 I've actually got some bookings now so uh, a busy a very busy excuse me a very busy diary that I've got at present yeah well we really appreciate taking the time to do this Rick and as I said it'll be a few weeks before Rick has the opportunity to do the Sunday demo at his discretion so we will keep yeah. his informed um, and maybe Rick prior to your demo if you would just have the names of the materials and that used at you know, we can just click them in, send them to me or Paul, we'll put them into the chat box and people can work from there. Maybe you could suggest alternative materials that people can't avail of. Or, And obviously the biggest factor with that jig of yours is safety all around that, which I know Absolutely, that you yeah. talk about in your demonstrations. I've seen you doing it, so and yeah. it's very well done. I mean, one, one point I have made, people have copied this. I did actually consider patenting it, but uh, I spoke to a patent advisor and he basically said to me, unless I got £10,000 to potentially blow, he said, he said, don't go there. He said, just enjoy using it and demonstrating it. So that's what I do. Uh, some people have copied it and had a go at making it themselves. Uh, one person who, I don't remember who he was, but he, he screwed a faceplate onto the back of a piece of plastic just using some wood screws. And to me, that's just suicidal because it will inevitably work loose very quickly. Uh, it's a yielding plastic. It does absorb, absorb vibration but it certainly is not designed to be uh, held in that kind of manner and spun around at any speed. Yeah. Um, so if you do, you know, anybody watching the video tonight, if you're interested in, in making one, do so, but don't cut corners would be my advice. Yeah, and maybe wait until Rick goes more in depth to it in the Sunday demo before you would attempt something like this, because the usual story with these things is when somebody is very familiar at using it and good at it, they make it look easy. And that is a difficult thing that Rick is turning there with once you're off center at all and he has different, I'm sure Rick will say more about weights and things, counterbalances and all sorts in his uh, demonstration. But uh, yeah, Rick, really appreciate your time on that because I know you were busy and we're heading up to half past nine. Just okay. one last question, Rick, your LED lights, please. Yes, LED lights. Uh, I'll just swap camera over again. Okay, so the lighting. Uh, I've got six LED panel lights. They are the 600 millimeter square ones, and I just position them <coughs> around the workshop, uh, really so I get no uh, shadows anywhere where I'm working. I've got the two lathes set up over here, um, so I've got the the uh, my demonstration come tuition lathe. I forgot to show you the big piece in the corner. I'm not sure about it. I need two minutes just to show you this one. If that's okay, Pat. Yeah, perfect. Sure. Right. This piece, uh, my treasure, my pride and joy. Hopefully you can see it. Uh, I mentioned my very good friend, Andrew. Uh, there's a little story behind this piece here. Uh, Andrew was doing a demonstration at Sheffield Water and Club. And uh, we had our friend from, um, from um, the group mill came along with these, uh, this piece of elm beautiful piece of butterfly open elm and um, at the time I just got my like cheap Chinese lathe and had absolutely no way of doing anything with it but as I said I'm a, I'm a wood hoarder 
So I bought this piece of wood. Uh, Andrew called me at the end of the night and he said, you know, if you haven't bought that, he said, I've had that. So um, I thought the only, the only decent thing to do was uh, to, to go and actually work on this wood with Andrew. So uh, I went and had a couple of very enjoyable days learning um, the techniques around uh, slow turning. Uh, it is quite fundamental. Imagine this piece was turned as one. Its dimensions probably about um, three foot by two foot. It was turned as one piece outboard on the on the one way lathe. Um, so you can see where the centers of rotation are. So this point here and this point here. So when it was turning here, all this area was propelling around quite a quite a massive arc. We were turning at heavy speed, probably about 100, 100 to 150 RPM if we were lucky. So it was very, very slow uh, turning that we did at the time. Uh, I'm just going to walk away from the mic and show you some of the detail on it, just so you can appreciate that. So not only is it turned on the face, it's also turned, this is also textured, carved, and coloured. I'm just trying to show you the best I can. So Carl, Rick, you've gone away from your microphone again, Rick. I'm just showing you around the piece. I'll come back to the mic in a moment. Yeah, we need to hear you if you're telling us stuff. So, coloured and textured on the edges, carved, scorched, and machined on just about every on every angle and facet of the piece. So it was a, a lovely, enjoyable piece to turn, and uh, a very enjoyable day to have with uh, with Andrew. I'm just switching back to my camera. Yeah, so yeah, very, very enjoyable piece that uh, we, we turned together. So it was a bit of a collaboration, uh, and it really just got me into thinking about how you know, different holding techniques and methods. So I will share that piece in a lot more detail on the on the Sony demo because it is more of the backstory, of the story behind why I got into the the, the multi-axis turning, the off-center turning. That's what really lit the uh, lit the flame for me. Okay, Rick, thank you very much. Um, it looks like you're giving Helen a run for her money and the tidy workshop, according to the comments. My, my floor uh, needs repainting. Um, yeah, I, I just can't emphasize this enough. People are just so caught up on the cleanliness. The biggest thing that we're looking for is safety, okay? Yeah. If it's a working workshop, there's going to be a bit of a mess or you're not turning. Do you hear that, Helen? Do you hear that, Rick? So, <laughs> all the just all messing aside once it's safe, okay? That's the priority. That's it. But, uh, the, re the reason it's clean is because it's small. It's only fibre three. If I let it get a mess, I can't find anything. So I enjoy it, but I clean up at the end of the day.